Hi, this is J.P. Morgan. And this is Kenneth Merrill. Today on the Slime Lens, we snuck over to a field next to my house. We've been over here before, but it's quiet. We're all alone, social distancing, but bringing a new camera view, the X1D Mark II Hasselblad 50C. Join our Patreon group. Yeah, it was really fun shooting in Hollywood today. Not many people around. It's kind, no, of, it's kind of different, quiet. different for Hollywood. It's fun down there because it's a really huge tourist area, but yeah. nobody's there at, at, at five in the morning. Especially no one's there. The morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyways, not. these medium format cameras, especially Hasselblad, are really good at capturing tonality and color. So we shot the neon signs down there. We're going to shoot these sunflowers with a blue sky, green grass. I mean, we're looking at a 50 megapixel sensor here, but that's not 50 megapixels. It's a, on a large sensor. It's almost twice the size of a normal 35 millimeters. 1.7? Yeah, 1.7 times the size of a, of a full frame camera. So it's 50 megapixels, but the, the pixels are bigger, which allows you to collect more light and collect more information, really. That's why the colors and the tonality come out so nicely with these cameras. We've seen a huge upgrade from the first version of the Hotspot. The first version of the Hotspot was a little slow, a little sluggish. Mm -hmm. Seems like this one has resolved a lot of those problems because it's much quicker, responds quicker. Uh, it's just all around a little quicker interface. When you think of full frame, you think fast, quick, sports, being able to run a gun and shoot a lot, high frame rates, all those kinds of things. It was the same in the days of 35 millimeter film versus two and a quarter film. When you think of two and a quarter, the reality is you're slowing the process down. You're more deliberate. You're lighting things. You're setting things up. You're not shooting 30 frames a second. It's not a sports camera. It's made to give you really great images, portraits, great street portraits even, but it's not meant to be a run-and-gun speedster kind of platform. That said, this does shoot three frames per second raw, and each raw file is like 100 megabytes on average because they're 16-bit That's crazy, 100 with, megabytes. With, yeah, with 14 stops of dynamic range. I mean, there's so much information that you're packing into each image. It's really, really awesome, but it is definitely for a slower workflow, a little more deliberate. So we're gonna go shoot some more, just see how this camera does. I'm sure we'll find some things in it that maybe aren't as perfect as we might sound right now, but let's shoot some more shots and see what we got. I love this shooting in this time of day when the sun's starting to rise because you have the sunlight and that gradient in the sky from light blue to really deep blue, and then you also have a lot of other point sources and gradients from other lights, like these neon lights that we're shooting. So you get to see how the camera handles subtle tonality, which I think is where medium format really shines because that big sensor, uh, larger image circle lenses and the 16-bit raw. So here's one of the first images we shot. I like this one because you have the streak from a car moving through mm -hmm. the bottom of the frame. I mean, it's not an amazing image, but there's some fun things here. The lens flares from these lights over the sign are awesome, and you're going to see that throughout these really cool stars. And this for the uh, aperture is wide open, right? Yeah, I believe we shot most of this wide open. Because usually when you get a flare yeah. like that, it's when you get a, a mm -hmm. you're stopped down to f11 or f16, yeah. you know? So that's interesting. So, uh, I love these reflections in the Star Walk yeah. you know, because the pavement's so shiny. The color is just spectacular. I mean, even like you said in the El Capitan on the left here, you, it's still, even though it's overexposed there, it's still holding color and yeah. you don't feel like it's just gone. Yeah. It's not pushing those reds into like a weird purple or anything like yeah. that. Sometimes you'll see that with other cameras because they, they don't know what to do when the color goes out of gamma. Yeah. Work. And again, here you have on the far right side of the image, you have that pale blue, and yep. it goes into this really deep blue, Greatest and the colors deep. are so rich in that, that turquoise sort of green. What I love about these images, too, is there's so much depth to them. There is. You know? And then the subtlety of, again, the subtlety of the tones in this image of the entrance to the Kodak Theater, like the colors are so subtle, but the camera doesn't make them all the same color. So if you look at like the, the shot of the uh, two palm trees, the one thing about this camera that I did find a little bit difficult was you don't have a pop-out screen. So when you get that camera mm -hmm. down low, trying to look up at those palm trees, I'm down there, you know, into that. And that was a little bit difficult. I, I wish it had a pop-out screen. I can't yeah. imagine how hard that would be on a camera like this, but uh, that's one thing I, I was missing when it was down low. We also shot an ISO test, so let's take a look at that. This is the same scene it's the El Capitan Theater, and we're shooting it at different ISOs. Yep. Starting at 100, went yeah, straight 100 through. Yeah, 100 here. Not lit up there, but then we go to 200, and it should be pretty consistent throughout the rest. 800 now. So there's 8. 800. 1600. 1600. You're just really not seeing. 3200. 3200. I feel like 3200 is when I first start to see it a little in the sky a around in the here. Sky. And again, I mean, we're looking at it on a screen that's, you know, what, 15 inches tall. So mm -hmm. if you're blowing it up bigger, you're going to see it more, but and then 6400, you definitely start to see noise here. There is a loss of detail there. Yeah, absolutely. 12,800. So 
there does come a point where it starts to get pretty gritty. I mean, maybe you could print this, maybe you could noise reduce this um, at, at 12,000 and use it in some way, but that's gonna be much more of a look. So even when you go to 25,600, it was not very long ago that we would look at 25,600 and go, well, that was a waste of time to shoot. Mm -hmm. you know. But you look at it now and you're going, yeah, it's pretty grainy and it, it's got a lot of noise, but it's not, like, it's not like you're going, holy cow, I can't stand yeah. that. <laughs> well, I'll say, I will say the colors are consistent throughout the entire yes. range. You don't see the red there's, change. There's almost no color shift and this is still cleaner than a roll of 3200 ISO film I shot oh, yeah. last year. So, <laughs> I mean, the, the capability. The comparison, but. Yeah, I just the capability of this camera is pretty amazing when it comes to color and capturing a clean image, even at high ISOs. Yeah, ISO, uh, it really, I mean, you have such a large sensor and it allows you to capture and to render mm -hmm. this image so much easier at that higher ISO. Yep. So this is more of a sunlit, yeah. you know, middle of the day uh, kind of image and want to just look and see how it handled it, how the bokeh and how the out of focus falls behind it. I mean, it is a 35 millimeter lens at, at 3.5 is wide open. So it's not like you're going to get a, a huge fall off, but you do, it falls off. It's, it's not a, like it's a 90 or 150 millimeter lens. You can't focus super close with this lens. I mean, so we couldn't get like any macro shots or anything. Mm -hmm. I think it's 16 inches is the minimum focus distance, but Still some pretty stuff. Then we got some portraits. This is just with natural light and a bounce, just a you know, yep, the sun's in the background, light. a little fill from a bounce. It shows you a pretty good idea of how it's going to hold that skin tone. You've got mm -hmm. a really hard sunlight mm -hmm. on the uh, face. Okay. Look at the fall off on your shirt there. That's the yeah. focus is falling off pretty fast. Pretty quick. And again, I just love, I mean, I feel like you can really see it in this portrait. You're shooting on a 45 millimeter lens. Mm -hmm. So it has that nice depth to it, but at the same time, you have a, a pretty wide field of view for that 45. So yeah, you just do. a unique look compared to, to full frame. So this is one of the aspects of this camera that I absolutely love and have loved with Hasselblad since I bought my 500CM forever ago. And that is that it will sync at pretty much any shutter speed, any shutter speed, because it's a leaf, uh, leaf shutter in the lens. So it's going to open and close and it allows you to sync at any shutter speed, which means that you don't need high speed sync on a strobe. It allows you to go all the way to 2,000th of a second. It only goes to 2,000, it doesn't go to 4,000. Right. So there is a limitation there, but you go to 2,000th of a second and you can sync your strobe without any problem at any aperture at that uh, at 2,000th of a second. I also found out that the, uh, the uh, FJ400s from Westcott will sync with the trigger with the Hasselblad. And it, it's not one of the cameras you can choose in the menu, but I just put it on, I can't remember which one I put it on. I didn't think I was it even just, <laughs> just put it on, <laughs> turn it on, and it, it synced just fine. So it, that, with the Westcott strobes, the FJ400, which I love the, that strobe setup, this synced with their trigger and worked flawlessly. So we did our dynamic range test a little differently this time. I'm sitting inside, and the exposure inside is seven stops darker than it is outside. And you can see it real fast. This is the uncorrected image where it's just a black, black silhouette, silhouette, you know, and all you're seeing is through the window. And then, you know, we brought the shadows back up and here it is. And there is some banding, you know, in a sweater, yep. a little splotchiness in both of them. The Sony is a lot more green. It's pulling out all these green Much patterns more and green. stuff. Yep. Um, Boy, neither yeah. one's doing great. No, and, and I would have to say the Hasselblad feels more uh, magenta. Yep. It's pushed very magenta, Definitely. whereas the Sony's pushed green. But we move even into just one stop brighter than that, so we're not struggling as much in the shadows, and already it's looking pretty nice. So now yeah. at this point, we move the exposure more towards the shadows by a stop. Mm -hmm. And if we go to another stop... It's looking good. Looking very good. And we're still holding the outside. The dynamic range is really good on the Hasselblad because it's holding all the information in the highlights outside, and the shadows are preserving this beautiful color and tonality, and uh, you know you don't have as many noise or color problems as he did in the earlier exposures. Yeah. I feel like the if you look at like the table, the blue on the table in the Hasselblad is a lot more pronounced mm -hmm. than it is on the Sony. And then, you know, the magenta in your face. I just feel like there's a lot more separation between the colors that's going on in the image. It's pretty subtle, but that's the difference that you get between like a 16-bit raw file and, and a 14-bit raw file that you have with the Sony. Yeah, and a larger sensor and larger you know, sensor. you got a lot yeah. of things going for it. Yeah. So right here we're three stops overexposed. For the outside. Yeah, yeah, for the outside. And we're starting to lose the highlights of the car and that are starting a to burn out. A little bit, especially Boy, the much Sony. much more in the Sony. Yeah, the Sony's not holding it as well. Yeah. Overall, I think, I feel like the tonality of the Hasselblad is smoother, but they're both doing really well. Yep. And then here we are, four stops over. 
both cameras are starting to clip on the outside. It's not holding as much information. And five, steps, five stops over the outside, it's looking really bad. I think it clips a little quicker on the Sony than it does the Hasselblad. Yeah, bond. that's definitely true. I mean, only by about a half a stop, yeah. though. Here's exposed for the inside. You look great, JP. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, it's really, it points to one thing in this principle we've talked about here on the channel over and over again, and that is that you cannot overexpose your highlights in, in digital photography. You've got to retain the highlights. You're better to underexpose by a stop and sometimes even two stops to be able to maintain the highlights and then you can bring back the shadows in post. So I, I'm not saying as a general rule, but if you're in a dark silhouette situation or you want to bring backlight situation, you want to bring detail into the foreground, you're going to need to underexpose the background. So there's a look at some great images. How did you feel? I mean, we talked about all the specs up front. Um, we used it. We did talk about the one thing that was a little difficult. I love using autofocus and autofocus points, and I want to move that point around. And you have to reach all the way over to this button. Now, maybe I don't think you can change that. I don't think so. I mean, you can so, use... You can use the touch screen on the back to adjust your focus you can, point. But I don't like I don't like having to pull it away from my face. I feel like I'm not quite framing. Hit the button. I just wish that button wouldn't set your reach because I'm you're going to be reach. using that all the time. That's probably the button you'll use here next to the to the exposure button the most. Yeah, and it's all the way over, and you have to hold it down for one second, which is a little bothersome. That's a long time. Yeah, <laughs> sure. I mean, it's a really sleek body. Um, but I do, I'll admit, I do wish there were a couple more buttons. I wish the buttons more, more clearly marked. Um, I felt like, I, granted I could have read through the manual and figured it all out, but picking up the camera and looking at the back, I didn't really understand what half the buttons were supposed to do. And even after shooting it for half a day, it still felt like I didn't have a great grasp on how to access things in the menu quickly. Um, the touch I mean the touch screen menu is awesome. You can add quick icons to the back so you can customize it a lot. It's very useful, but at the end of the day, my personality, my workflow is such that I prefer buttons. You know, it is interesting though. Uh, one thing I found kind of appealing is that you didn't have so many things in the menu. It wasn't miles and miles yeah. deep. You know, it was a quick get to this, find that, it does this. I don't know. I thought yeah. after just using it for a couple of days, I think you'd be pretty intuitive. I think you'd be fine. Yeah, I, you're probably so. right. And again, this is more for a slower, it's frankly for a slower workflow. You're not, this yeah. isn't a run and run, street photography, sports, event Although stuff. I think you could do some street photography. This would be kind of fun. Probably. But, but you know what? Small, compact. I got a great grip so I can hold on to it. So yeah. I feel very comfortable yeah. in my hand. I don't feel like I'm going to drop it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a different kind of camera than you're probably used to if you're shooting your Sonys or your Nikons or your Canons. But I got to say, after looking at the images, I'm like, man, it's, it's hard to turn down the imagery. Yeah. You almost feel like you can put up with the quirks yeah. <laughs> just to get that. Well, they're not, they're not so bad. You yeah. know? It's not like you're, <laughs> and if you're shooting a landscape, you're not trying to shoot multiple frames a second. And, right. you know, it's like... Right. Uh, even with the strobes, you can shoot multiple frames a second. We were using the Westcott FJ400s and dialed down a little bit, and it was firing, and you can just keep shooting. It was yeah, nice it was that way. Awesome. It's a point where it's got a buffer. But All right, so who's this camera for? Who do you see buying this camera? I mean, um, we're around $6,000, right? Just under? I mean, I think anybody doing fashion, doing architecture, especially architecture, because of that large sensor and the lenses are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. um, landscape, maybe still life stuff. A yeah. really, really good application for it. So this starts to get into the world of competing with, you know, this medium format, large sensor. There's only several options out there. There are not very many out there. And so it's just interesting to look at those. I'd like to see us compare this to some of the other options that are out there. Just get an idea of where it stands and what the picture quality looks like. So, all right, so there's something for in the future. Make sure you subscribe to us here at the Slamland. Ring that bell or whatever that is so that every time we get a new video, you'll know about it. We hope you enjoy the things we got. Got a great group over at Patreon that are, uh, we're meeting with them regularly and having a great experience there. So make sure you're part of our Patreon group. So keep those cameras rolling. And keep on clicking.